Hey guys, Brian here with you for another adventure in Oceania. Before we get started today, I want you to make sure you've got the PDF for this lesson printed out and ready to go. Seriously, we need it before we even get started. You should find a map on page 2 that shows human migration throughout history. Do you have it? Good! In case you don't, here it is. I want you to examine it closely. Notice the dates showing how many years ago humans first arrived on each continent. For example, Southwest Asia 100,000 years ago, Asia 70,000, Europe 40,000, and so on. You'll notice that only continents are dated on this map. Based on what you see, I want you to guess which smaller landmass was the last one that humans settled. Don't pick continents like South America. Think instead about large islands like Borneo or Madagascar. Pause the video and really take a look. Identify your top two guesses on the map, and if you're feeling brave, you can even take a stab at identifying a date you think people first arrived there. What's your top guess? Iceland? Greenland? Japan? Actually, it's none of those, but the title of the video might have been a pretty big clue. Yep, New Zealand was the last major landmass to be settled, but knowing when it was settled might blow your mind. Our map here shows that humans first settled down in Australia well over 50,000 years ago. New Zealand is approximately 1,200 miles away from Australia, which is about the same distance as Borneo. And Borneo is directly under our line that shows a migration to Australia. So, it shouldn't have taken that long for Australians to find New Zealand. Right? Well, we'll learn today that the first settlers in New Zealand were the Maori, who arrived here somewhere around CE 1320. That's 50,000 years after Australia was settled. Crazy. Welcome, friends, to the serene, remote splendor of New Zealand. Well, sometimes. <laughs> this little guy will be our guide throughout the video. Consider his Takata call your challenge to learn more about New Zealand. Our lesson objectives today are to describe New Zealand's land and climate, its cultural background, and its economic and political structures. Ready, explorer? Let's learn about the Kiwis down south. New Zealand is on the tail end of the Ring of Fire, which means we can expect it to consist of some geologically active islands. New Zealand's backbone is a volcanic mountain chain along the Indo-Australian and Pacific tectonic plates. The country is about 1,200 miles off the east coast of Australia, across the Tasman Sea, and is typically grouped with Australia as a part of the continent of Australasia. The Maori name for New Zealand is Aotearoa, which means the land of the long white cloud, accounting for its temperate climate and natural splendor. The country is divided into two main islands the North Island and the South Island. The North Island is smaller by area, but has a much larger population. Both islands have a fairly temperate climate, but North Island is warmer and has a more subtropical feel, as it is closer to the equator. It also has excellent natural harbors, which are good for sailing in and out of. The North Island is narrow and hilly, and has a highland plateau and active geothermal region in the center, with volcanoes, geysers, and hot springs. Because three quarters of the population lives on the North Island, it is home to Auckland, New Zealand's largest city, which has a huge port and airport and is the center of international trade. The South Island is larger, cooler, and is home to fjords and the Southern Alps. The fjords along the coast make it a little tougher to sail into. The South Island also hosts Christchurch. New Zealand's second largest city, with only a quarter as many residents as Auckland. Though technically on the North Island, Wellington, the national capital and seat of government, is located on the Cook Strait, which runs between the islands. 
Let's pause here for a critical thinking question. Based on what you've learned about New Zealand's land and climate, why do you think three-quarters of the people live on the North Island? Pause the video and respond in your PDF. New Zealand was first inhabited by the Maori. Scholars don't have enough evidence yet for their hunch to be considered irrefutable proof, but there is general consensus that the Maori's ancestors were from East Polynesia and that they traveled to New Zealand from the northeast by canoe, arriving somewhere around CE 1320. Competing narratives place ancestors in Malaysia from the northwest or even Peru from South America. The Maori themselves say they are from the uncharted Polynesian island of Hawaii, the place where the supreme being Io created the world and its first people. When English Captain James Cook arrived in the 18th century, the Maori did not consider themselves a nation. There were many tribal groups, each with their own culture and customs. They traded with each other, but were very territorial over their lands. By 1840, European settlement pressured the Maori to act in a more unified way, as a single nation with a shared history and future. They made a treaty with the British, accepting British rule in exchange for land rights. In 1996, the New Zealand government conceded that a huge swath of land on the North Island had been taken from the Maori without their consent and required that the Maori be compensated for the use of their land in various areas of the North Island. The Manamotuhake, or Self-Determination Party, represents the 17% of the New Zealand population that identifies as Maori. Its primary goal is to reclaim Maori lands and preserve Maori culture. Connection to the land is very important in Maori culture, as traditional arts include Waikaro, Raranga, Kapahaka, Waikarero, and Ante Moko. But in Western culture, the Maori are probably best known for a haka called Kamate, a war cry performed by Maori warriors before battle to intimidate their enemy. This now is mainly seen at rugby matches. New Zealand is home to about 5 million people, making it the 126th most populated country in the world. There are people from a variety of ethnic groups, including British, Maori, other Pacific Islanders, and an extreme minority of many other groups. The percentage of Asian immigrants is increasing. New Zealand is a constitutional monarchy, with the Queen of England serving as the ceremonial head of state. All legislative power resides with the democratically elected parliament, who work here in the Beehive. The Parliament has made Maori, English, and New Zealand Sign Language all official languages of the government, though most proceedings are in English. Despite having the 126th largest population, the Kiwis have the 52nd highest GDP, meaning a strong GDP per capita. Okay, it's critical thinking time. Why do you think that New Zealand's economy has outperformed the global average in terms of GDP and GDP per capita over the last couple of centuries? Pause the video and write a response in your lesson guide. It probably has something to do with New Zealand being a part of the British Commonwealth. Did you catch the part about how the Queen of the United Kingdom is still New Zealand's ceremonial head of state? More than half of GDP comes from the service industry, meaning that people are doing tasks for each other, such as serving their food or grooming their pet rather than selling tangible products. Mining, farming, and manufacturing account for only 20% of the economy. Unsurprisingly, over 25% of the world's kiwi fruits are grown in New Zealand. So this nation is known for the fruit and the bird we saw before. Modern NZers are fondly known as kiwis, and these plants and animals are all considered symbols of the country. This silver fern flag was actually submitted as an alternative flag in 2015 to symbolize New Zealand's post-colonial sovereignty, but more voters chose to retain the current flag instead of adopting the new design. New Zealand had one of the highest standards of living in the world in the 1970s and 80s. But as most of their exports were to the UK, slowing economic growth in the UK and high tariffs imposed by the European Union have taken a toll on New Zealand's economy in recent decades. Don't worry, the Kiwis are still growing, but slower than they had been 50 years ago. 
Hmm, let's think about that. For our last critical thinking question of the day, let's make a comparison between the emerging New Zealand economy and a more personal example. Let's say you owned your own business selling lemonade. Having a customer that buys in bulk is great for the growth of your company, right? On the other hand, what do you think the risks are for selling most of your product to a single customer? That's exactly right. If something happens to that customer, it can have a serious impact on your business. In short, putting all your eggs in one basket is risky. You gotta spread those things out. When EU tariffs or import taxes were imposed, it limited dairy product sales, for example, to New Zealand's biggest trading partner, and some Kiwis were out of work. This explains the Kiwis' efforts to diversify or vary their economic output, and their pivot to many service jobs, their expanding film and music industries, and their fastest growing industry, information technology. New Zealand has fared well in the past few years, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic compared to the rest of the world. Signs are pointing upward for its progress in the 21st century and beyond. What are your predictions for New Zealand's future?